I'm going to go through a complete example start to finish setting up an ATtiny85 with Micronucleus bootloader to give it USB support and then using Windows 10 get this ATtiny USB board programmed with a rotary joystick sketch from the Arduino IDE and links to any of the things I'm referencing will be in the description. This is a specific project I did maybe five years ago. So these arcade joysticks can plug into the board and when you rotate clockwise or counterclockwise, it will send a keystroke over USB so the computer knows when you're using a video game emulator, which way are you rotating this? And this whole design using ATtiny85 for USB is based on these old DigiSpark boards. Those don't seem to exist anymore and trying to find project examples right now has been difficult. So that's why I'm going through the process again. I'm going to do this using those same versions of the bootloader and any other utilities to upload firmware that I was using five years ago because those are still available in places like GitHub. So the idea with a blank ATtiny85 like the one here on the breadboard since ATtiny85 does not have USB support, we need this special hardware circuitry and we have to program a bootloader in here to give it software emulated USB capabilities. So to get that bootloader in, I'm using an Arduino Uno as an ISP programmer. And that's set up like this. First, forget about any of the wiring and the capacitor, just having the Uno itself plugged in to the computer and then having the Arduino IDE open. I'm getting scan lines on the video, but there's not much I can do because I can't screen capture right now. So in the IDE, I go to the examples, Arduino ISP, and I choose the Arduino Uno board. And it looks like it's on COM13 and the programmer, AVR ISP, is that Mark II? And then upload. Now it's done uploading. So now I can have this all wired up. And now that I set this up as a programmer, I need to add this capacitor. Maybe between one and 10 microfarads is good enough. Positive will go to reset, negative goes to ground. And that's because when the computer starts a programming process, Usually it reboots whatever it's plugged into on USB, but we don't want this Uno now to reboot. So the capacitor keeps the reset from triggering. Then the computer continues giving programming instructions to the Uno and the Uno does the resetting and programming of the ATtiny. And they don't show it here, but I also add a 100 nano decoupling capacitor across VCC and ground on the breadboard so pins eight and four, because sometimes with all the long wires, programming may struggle a bit. So sometimes I found having a local capacitor helps. So I'm gonna put this capacitor on now. Now when I wanna put the micronucleus bootloader into the ATtiny, this is all ready to go and plugged in on COM13, so I need to remember that. And again, links are going to be in the description for anything. So in order to use the ATtiny as a USB device, especially on Windows, we need to install Windows drivers so it will recognize the USB device when plugged in. I've seen a few different versions of things, but right now I'm using this zip file on this GitHub page. So I just clicked and downloaded this zip file. And when I extracted the zip file, I ran dpinst64.exe for this 64-bit Windows 10 and allowed it to install Windows drivers. So after I did that, I was able to recognize one of these ATtiny's plugged in over USB. The next thing I needed to do was get the Micronucleus bootloader firmware file, which is a hex file, to flash into the ATtiny85. So going to this GitHub location, Version 2.4 is not the latest, but it is what I was using five years ago. So I wanted to get this exact same version. And the file we need is t85 
default.hex. So you can go here and just download that. One way to download files individually from GitHub, if you don't just go download the whole thing and go to the folders on your own. If I click this T85 default hex, once this file opens, over on the far right, there's an icon to download raw file. So if I click that and download, I get the T85 default hex file wherever the browser downloaded it. So that was the actual bootloader firmware for the chip. On another section of that GitHub repo, we now need the AVR dude executable and configuration two files here, which are the Windows program to actually do the uploading. So if we one by one click each of these and download the raw file and save it in the same place as the hex file, then we just need one more file. On my GitHub project folder for this whole thing, I made a batch file to run in Windows called flash underscore bootloader dot bat. So that should also be downloaded to the same folder as those other hex and AVR dude files. And all this does when it's run, it just has all of these command line parameters for AVR dude that are needed to do the ATtiny85 programming with the Arduino Uno as an ISP programmer, specifying that we're using the AVR dude config file, baud rate 19.2k, the name of the hex file we are programming into the ATtiny, and how we want to set internal fuses in the ATtiny to configure things like clock speed and other features. And this percent one is a command line parameter we need to specify when we're running the batch file, which is the COM port, whichever one the Arduino programmer is on, because that can change. So you actually run this by saying flash underscore bootloader, and then whatever the COM port is, in my case, I would then put COM13. If you don't do that, you'll just get this error and usage reminder. When you do say the COM port though, it will go and run the command and hopefully do the programming. There's my download folder location. So there's those Windows USB drivers in that folder. Then we have the bootloader micronucleus hex file, the AVR dude files, and the flash bootloader batch file to run this. So I opened a command prompt. And if I run just flash bootloader without saying what the COM port is, it tells me I've got to specify the COM port. So I'll do it again and say, COM13, and when I hit enter, AVR Dude is running, and it verified successfully, confirming the fuses that I do expect to see. In the past, sometimes it has some error reading fuses. It seems like rebooting the Arduino Uno programmer allowed it to do this successfully. And just a note about those ATtiny fuses. This is a web page with a fuse calculator for the chip. So I entered in the fuse settings that we are programming with. And on here, conveniently, it'll show you what options of the chip are enabled or disabled with those fuses. So three main things we are doing. We are setting clock sources so we can run the chip at the proper speed. We are allowing self-programming of the chip so we can upload with the bootloader over USB. And for the project with this joystick, we are disabling the reset pin on the chip. So we're using it as a GPIO input because we need all the pins we can get. So because we are removing the chip's reset capability on the pin, now that I've set the fuses, I can no longer use that Arduino as a programmer. I can only program over USB. So if I need to reprogram this for some reason using the Arduino programmer, I'm going to have to use a high voltage programmer, which uses 12 volts, to override this and help reset the fuses so that reset will function again and we can then go back to using the Arduino programmer. So I've done a couple of projects on high voltage fuse programming. I will link to a video. 
But if everything goes okay on the first run and we don't brick the chip, we shouldn't need to worry about that for this purpose. Now I took the AT Tiny off of the breadboard programmer and I can put it on this joystick USB board. And now with the bootloader, when I plug this into USB, Windows should know what it is and then the Arduino IDE should allow me to put the actual joystick monitoring sketch in there. So we'll do that part now. We don't plug it in yet. The IDE will tell us when. That's just some quirk with the way it works. So the joystick project files on GitHub. Now we can get the rotary joystick INO file and open that up in the Arduino IDE. So the sketch is open. And if we have not done one of these type of projects before and we're not set up for it, we go to the file preferences. And again, I'll have links to everything, but we have to add this additional board manager for these digi stump boards. That was the name of the DigiSpark that this whole thing is based on. And I'm using the IDE version 2.3.3. Then we can go to this board manager and search for DigiStump AVR. And I've got the only one available with that configuration, 1.6.7. This got abandoned, but this is what I was originally using. And this is part of the confusion. There's this other project that took it over and they had other versions, even 2 dot something, and then that got abandoned and it got assimilated into some AT Tiny Core project, but I think they have issues with the USB functionality. So I'm just going right back to the roots. So then libraries, we need to install bounce2 for button debouncing, and I have version 2.1 installed, there are later versions, but I tried the latest. It did not compile, so I arbitrarily chose this and it compiled. So I'm just going to stick with it. So now with the board file set up, we go to the tools and choose the board, Digistump AVR boards, and we want Digispark default 16.5 megahertz, even though this says millihertz, lowercase m. And that should be all we need to configure in there because there is no port needed for USB programming and the only programmer is Micronucleus. So it knows what to do at this point. So again, the board is not yet plugged into USB, but we can hit upload and it will compile and try to upload. And when it's ready, it will tell us plug in the board. So it is now telling me plug it in and it's giving me 60 seconds. I just plugged it in now. And it found it after a couple of seconds, and it looks like it was 100% complete programmed. This UNO programmer is not part of the equation. This is just a USB extension. So I'm plugged in with this USB board. And now, if I take the joystick, I have this command prompt open again. I'll clear the screen. So now if I rotate, it's working right now. It gave R for right and it has L for left. Sometimes you might have to unplug and replug this after programming to let it officially recognize as a keyboard. So it may not respond perfectly. It's only an emulation in the first place. So if I go two times right, right, and then two times left, left, three times, right, 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 left, left, left. And if I go fast, it may miss some, but that's to be expected with this kind of project. Bunch of rights, bunch of left, right, left, right, left. So that's as good as we're gonna get on this whole project, but it seems to be working fine. And that's how in 2024, we can get up and running like it's 2019.